Hi all. Yesterday, June the 6th, 2016, the sad news reached us that Viktor Lvovich Skotchnoi had died in a hospital in Switzerland at the age of 85. In this video I want to pay him a tribute. Many chess players consider Skotchnoi the stronger chess player of the modern era to have never been world champion. He played in two world championship matches, both against Anatoly Karpov. The first one in 1978 in Baguio City, which was surrounded with a lot of political bombast, and the second one in 1981 in Lugano. The first one was a very closely contested affair, but in the second one Karpov proved more capable of standing of Korchnoi. Now let it be noted that Korchnoi was in his late 40s when he played these matches. An unprecedented example of a chess player peaking at a later age. And an example he remained. He continued playing competitive chess into his 80s, until Victor the Terrible, as he was nicknamed, had to resign his final game, his life. I remember Kochner mainly from the tournaments organized by Joop van Oostrom in Amsterdam, such as Youth Against Experience and similar tournaments. His defection, of course, from the Soviet Union to the Netherlands in 1976, where he would also partake in the Dutch Championship and simply crush the field, as well as his World Championships, of course, the games of which I have all played through. And, last but not least, also from a simultaneous exhibition in Amersfoort, the Netherlands, some 25 to 30 years ago, I don't remember the exact date, I decided to play the Dutch defense against Korsnoy and got crushed in 17 moves. I couldn't find the game anymore, unfortunately, or else I might have showed it to you. Yes, the Dutch and the King's Indian defense were openings that you were well advised not to play against Korsnoy. As a tribute to the late great grandmaster, I want to analyze a game that he played against Mikhail Tal during the 30th Soviet Chess Championship in Yerevan. Somehow this game has always left an impression on me. Korchnoi discusses this game himself on a DVD for chess base. And here and there I will gladly use his comments and annotations as well. So Korchnoi is playing white and tall. No surprises there, he's playing black. Korchnoi opens up with d4. And they play a modern Bononi opening. One of Tal's favorite weapons. Okay, this is all very well known theory. And I suppose that here's the first interesting move. There are many options here for white, but Korchnoi opts for the Fianchetto system with g3. Very solid setup. Bishop g7, Bishop g2, castles, castles. And now, knight a6. Kochnoi memorizes the fact that at the time the score between him and Tal was heavily in his favor with five wins and five draws. And Tal used to joke that it was just five against five. Okay. Um, Kochnoi suspects that Tal feared his preparation and therefore played this somewhat inferior knight a6 move. The normal move here is rook e8 followed by knight bd7, just putting pressure on the e5 square and down the e-file and so on. Okay. Um, Korchnoi now plays h2, h3, and um, this is connected with a well-known theme in Benoni, namely the fact that black is suffering from a lack of space. Had Korchnoi instead played e4 here, then that means that the knight becomes vulnerable to the queen and therefore it becomes possible to pin the knight. And with this pin, black might be able to exchange one of his uh, minor pieces um, and thereby just uh, freeing up his otherwise somewhat clogged up position. Okay. So, obviously when the pawn is still on e2, that is uh, not possible. Because if, let's say, white would play something else here, 
like a4 and now bishop g4 then white can always try knight d2 and then chase the bishop later with h2 h3 but white does want to play e2 e4 because that is part of his plan but he wants to do so without allowing black to play bishop g4 and be able to exchange minor pieces okay now why does white want to play e2 e4 here well that has to do with the fact that he has a majority in the center he has two pawns against one but black on the other hand has a majority on the queen side here he has three against two so very often pawn positions also dictate plans and strategy so white will try to aim for e2 e4 and then hopefully follow it up with e4 e5 attacking in the center and black will try and mobilize his queenside majority later on in the game okay well so h3 was played and now knight c7 was played and this move already aims to support the b5 thrust here by black but white is one move earlier he plays here e4 and now b5 would not be such a good idea because that pawn move would open up the long diagonal and would give white the opportunity to revive his bishop along that long diagonal with the move e5 which is already possible and now black can also make a serious mistake with d takes e5 when d5 d6 hits this knight but also very dangerously opens up the vis-a-vis -vis from this bishop towards this rook and now after knight e6 and knight e5 uh, the white already has a large advantage so after e4 black has to be careful and he shouldn't play b7 b5 too early now instead he should concern himself with white's thrust in the center and therefore Tal played knight d7 at least for the moment this blocks out the e4 e5 move because now two pieces and a pawn are controlling that square so what can Kochnoi do well continue with his mobilization rook e1 he plays and this also fits perfectly into uh, the scheme of things because it aims to support the e4 e5 move later again now b5 still isn't possible and Koshno gives this line now e5 again and after knight takes e5 there are some exchanges here and even an exchange sacrifice because after the recapture on e5 again there is this very nasty discovered attack d5 d6 and white remains on top so after rookie one Tall probably realized that it's it's not going to happen anytime soon this b7 b5 move and also his um, his opponents pawn push e4 e5 will be difficult uh, to prevent so therefore he decides that maybe the knight on c7 isn't the best piece and that who knows his opening setup has failed somewhat and that he should be more flexible and prepare for things to come and therefore he now plays knight e8 this is also quite a well-known theme or pattern from the Benoni and it has to do with the fact that as soon as this pawn comes here and these pawns get exchanged then at least this knight can hop into the beautiful d6 blockading square um, still allowing black some sort of a firm grip on the position at least he will not be run over uh, in that particular case so knight e8 was played and again Korshtong just simply uh, continues with his mobilization and he is asking black well you have three pieces competing maybe for this f6 square I'm trying to interfere a little bit with your coordination 
which piece would you like to put there? And um, I'm stressing the word piece because Korsai doesn't like the idea that Black would play f6 here because that would clog up his bishop that would leave a, a very serious weakness here on e6. White would just simply retreat his bishop and pawns uh, cannot move backwards. Korsai was very famous for repeating that uh, truism over and over again. Pawns cannot move backwards, so he would consider this a serious weakness already in Black's camp. Well, after bishop g5, Tal decides to offer an exchange of his so far best minor piece with bishop f6. Now, Korsno emphasizes the fact that sometimes there are paradoxes in chess. And the paradox that he points at here is that now he has the opportunity to exchange Black's most active minor piece, namely the dark square bishop. But on the other hand, Black is still suffering from a lack of space. And now that the bishop is sitting on f6, at least the knights cannot go there. So now he prefers to retreat the bishop and just leave these pieces sitting here rather sillily if that is correct English. Okay, so bishop e3 was played. Well, we can see that white has managed to finish development and that black has a lot of pieces on the back rank. So obviously white is enjoying some sort of an opening advantage here. Even though he cannot push e4, e5 immediately, he may be able to do so later on by just simply uh, preparing more. But for the moment he's just ready for things to come and, as mentioned, has finished the opening quite nicely. Well, now Tal also starts to prepare uh, his counterplay. At first he removes the rook from this dangerous long diagonal. But not only that, of course, it also aims to support the b7, b5 push. Well, Korsner prevents that. Tall threatens it again, and Korsnay prevents it once more. Now at least he is defending up, oh, excuse me, he is defending the b5 square no less than three times. So for the moment b7, b5 is not in the cards. Queen e7 is played, and now maybe the final piece that can be improved here is the knight. The knight moves out of the way. Sometimes it just wants to go to c4, from where it supports again the e5 move, but more importantly it also frees up the f-pawn so that it can move to f4 from, from where it also very seriously supports the e4, e5 thrust. So, um, well, Dahl thinks that the knight on e8 has done its duty and that maybe he is actually the first one to play um, the pawn thrust that he wants to play. Now he goes knight c7 and he brings in a 1 to 3rd defender of the b5 move. But Kortsen says, oh no 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 no, wait a second, I'm playing as well, f4. But Tom must have thought, well, what do you mean? I'm there quicker, right? I played b5. But Korsno says, well, listen, my pawn push in the center is more important and I'm not going to be distracted by your uh, little demonstration on the queen side. I'm playing e5. And this move comes with more force, because obviously it attacks a piece. And we also see that um, this pawn move is putting a pawn on the fifth rank on the half of the opponent, on the opponent's half of the board. And um, the b7, b5 move does not uh, achieve that. This means that white has a space advantage and that he has a few pieces that can jump into the e4 square, attacking even more stuff. So white's initiative is simply more serious than Black's 
on the queen side. Well, Tan openes d takes e5, but here comes the beautiful in between move. Mm. Corso cannot really recapture on e5 because then one of Black's major pieces would recapture and take up a nice position in the center. But instead, he now plays knight d e4, threatening a very nasty fork on knight and queen. So one of these two pieces has to move out of the way and Black has to lose time. Sorry. Tal opts here for queen d8, but now, instead of having to exchange his dark square bishop for black's dark square bishop, Korchnoi now managed to exchange the dark square bishop for one of his knights. That means that he remains with the bishop pair and also his dark square bishop, which can sooner or later harass black's king, which no longer has the defense of the fianchetto uh, Benoni bishop. So white is looking to harass black here on these dark squares later on. Well, for the moment he's a pawn down, but he has the initiative and the better minor pieces. He now goes d6, pushing again that, that somewhat awkward knight, knight e6, and now f takes e5, which restores material balance. And we can see that this whole um, exchange of pieces and pawns in the center has left white with a very nice pawn duo here in the center and it's already quite far up the board. And if that's not all, as mentioned, there also is this very strong dark square bishop which no longer has a counterpart and black king will start to feel the draft very soon. But tall is tall and he was a very a forceful defender. Now he played b4, making use of the fact that the white knight doesn't have any decent retreat squares, so the white knight really has to jump forward, but that allows black to exchange off even more pieces, which he does. And now at least black can say, I'm not suffering from, uh, from a lack of space anymore. I'm pretty sure that all my pieces will find pretty decent uh, outposts now. Also this knight is pretty unassailable. The only uh, white piece that can hope to eliminate this knight later, which for the moment is a very nice blockader of these uh, central pawns, is this bishop of course. But as soon as the bishop would exchange itself for the knight, then we would have a bishop of opposite colors and um, white would no longer have the bishop pair, of course. Okay, now the fact that there are bishops of opposite color is not the end of the world, as we will see, because this thing will uh, be, um, be prevalent later on in the game. But for now, Tal plays bishop b7, hitting the queen, and the queen retreats to d2. And somewhere around here, Korsnoy I thought that, hmm, maybe I don't even have so much advantage anymore. Black has managed to exchange some pieces. He's also managed to somehow uh, mobilize his pawn majority on the queen side. Um, I no longer have a pawn shield in front of my king on the second rank. I have only two of those, and they're on the third rank. And both of them require protection. And also, Last but not least, black now has counterplay along the completely open long light square diagonal. Tal, on the other hand, uh, thought that he was still worse and that somehow he had to keep uh, maintain the balance. Queen d7. And now, of course, now plays a very beautiful move. It's a prophylactic move. Before uh, continuing with any active plans, which involve probably putting the bishop on c4 and who knows maybe the rook on the semi-open uh, f-file and bringing in the other rook, for instance to c1 or d1, he now first plugs the holes on his king side. And 
what better piece to fulfill that function than the king? He plays king h2. And I think with this move he secures an advantage. So, um, well, we have seen that this piece has some future. We've also seen that this piece may have some future. We've seen that this rook may have some future. But what about black's rooks? Tal must have thought what to do with my rooks. And he came up with, uh, with this interesting idea. He played b3. The idea of which is to, let's say, put the bishop out of the way, for instance on c6 or on a8, and then be able to bring in the rook to e4, for instance, via b4. And that would give his position some, some, some air, some breathing space. Korstoy now plays rook a c1. And during his presentation he says time is money. And with that, of course, he means that he thinks it's more important to activate his rook, which is worth five points, rather than simply uh, protecting his pawn here on a4. Now, it was perfectly possible to also play a5, but then, of course, his piece play is a little bit slower, and sometimes you just have to make instinctive decisions, and uh, you're also faced with uh, practical issues, such as playing with the clock. So, I guess he just felt like, okay, let's just activate and see if Tal takes the bait, maybe not even being sure if it was a proper bait or not. Because the pawn on a4, yes, it can be taken and it's probably not even so poisonous, because, yeah, what else can, can black uh, do? At least with taking the pawn, which he did in the game, Tal is defending according to the principles of good defense, as discussed by me on my Dutch uh, website. Um, I went to a workshop that was given by Arthur Yusupov uh, a few months ago here in Amsterdam, and the workshop was about uh, defending. And the principle adhered to here is that with taking the pawn on a4, Tal is raising the stakes. You may be worse, but at least he's giving Korsnoy something to worry about being a pawn down. And potential counterplay down the line on the queen side with the creation of a passed pawn. So we can imagine that it puts some pressure on the, on the first player that now he's a pawn down and that better his overall advantage uh, should pay off sooner or later because otherwise these pawns will create a passed pawn sooner or later because there's only this lonely B pawn to deal with, right, on the queen side. Well, not so fast. Bishop c4 first. Now Korsner thinks that Toll makes a mistake. He should have gone, as he points out, bishop a8 to keep that bishop on the long diagonal. And yeah, that makes perfect sense, of course. But then he probably would have played rook f1, continuing with the activation of his rook. And the threat is uh, here, bishop h6, which would attack the defender of f7, and then if that defender would move, then the queen would move in for the kill on the f-file, and f7 would be deadly weakened. So that's the idea. But Tal could play queen c6 then in that case, and then after bishop h6, just simply um, sacrifice the exchange with knight d4. Because now, um, if you play bishop takes f8, like so, he would recapture with the rook, and he would have a very strong counterplay with his knight coming to f3, right? So, Korsnoy analyzed that after knight d4, he would not play bishop takes f8, but rather play rook f4. And this has the very nasty threat of taking the knight, and if black were to recapture, because otherwise he would just be down the knight, then there would be this discovered check with 
bishop takes f7 check, picking up the queen on the next move. So this rook f4 would be a very forcing move, and it would actually force Black's hand to play um, the check immediately. Then Korsnoy would be the one sacrificing the exchange, not at all. Because after queen takes f3, he now has the very strong d7. And he's just uh, threatening to promote, or first take on f8, excuse me, and then play d7, d8, and if black were to capture that newly born queen, then white would recapture again with a check. So this would still not be checkmate. Well, Tal could then play rook fd8, for instance, but then he's just blown to pieces with e6. And after f takes e6, bishop takes e6 check, king h8, I have a quiz question for you, involving one of the most common thinking processes in chess. What does white want to do, which is not yet possible? How to make that possible? Well, I'll count to three, pause the video for as long as you like, and then I'll come back and we can compare answers. One, two, three. Well, obviously, white wants to play queen, c3, check, and mate, right? Why can't he do it yet? Well, the queen is still protecting that square. Ah, so the queen is a defender. What are we supposed to do with defenders? We have to eliminate them. So the beautiful move here is rook f1. When after queen takes f1, king c3, excuse me, queen c3 is indeed a lethal check. So after rook f1, black cannot take that rook and he has to go queen e4. But that also lets go of the c3 square, square and then queen c3, queen d4, which is still possible. Queen takes d4, c takes d4. Now comes rook f7, threatening again mate on these dark squares. The final try for black is to defend the g7 square with rook g8. And now what? Again, let me count to three. Pause the video for as long as you like. One, two, three. Well, if we cannot check you from the right, we will check you from the left. The threat is now, of course, to go bishop f6, check, and so on. So, rook g7, bishop f6, bringing in the other rook for the defense, but now the pawn will decide. Um, or not even the pawn will decide, we don't even need it. We just check here, you have to recapture. And now, since your 8th rank is weakened, we will check you on the 8th rank. And of course this is checkmate. Well, interesting, yeah? Interesting. Okay. Well, um, in the game, Tal didn't play bishop a8. Instead he played bishop c8, giving up his control of the light squared. Uh, Long layer. Of course, not continued anyway with rook f1. And now Tal comes in with the rook, as he envisaged a few moves earlier. Rook b4, attacking the bishop. Now, it wasn't necessary to exchange that bishop on e6. Of course, I could have gone to d5 and just keep a very firm grip on the position. But apparently, he just believed in the fact that. If we exchange bishops at this particular moment, then in this particular position, the side with the initiative uh, normally has a very serious advantage, because I'm attacking on the dark squares. And those two pieces, they can't really defend on the dark squares. So, dear Black King, how on earth are you going to survive? Because this guy's gone here, this guy's gone here, and you're going to be mated, right? That is Korchnoi's uh, concept. Well, after bishop takes e6, recapturing on e6, Korchnoi immediately plays bishop h6, so the first attacking piece is already brought into position. Now, Tal doesn't want to give up the exchange, because then um, that would be a technically winning position, so he saves his rook, rook e8. And now the next piece comes in, queen g5. Of course, it's not possible to do that via f4. Um, 
But here comes Rook e4. And the idea here, I suppose, for for Tall is to try and defend the g7 square with his queen. But how on earth is he going to do that, right? And that's the passive um, defensive idea. The active defensive idea is to start some counterplay against White's also rather drafty king, right? So, rook e4 played. But Korsnoy is vigilant, he just plays rook f2, defending the second rank, and now again, queen f6 is a very serious threat. Now, maybe Tall had planned to go queen d4 here, when after queen f6, it would seem that queen e5 defends just in time, because there is this Röntgen defense through white queen of the g7 square. But now d7 wins, attacking the unprotected rook on e8. Um, if that rook moves, then pawn d8 queen simply wins. So what remains is really bishop takes d7, but then there's this, and after king h8, white uh, just simply picks up the piece and wins the game. So here, after rook f2, faced with the threat of queen f6, and probably seeing that queen d4 is not possible, he had to go for a more passive setup. The only thing left to do is to try and defend against the, the mate on g7 from the flank, in a lateral way. And for that he has to push his f-pawn. Because by pushing the f-pawn, now it becomes transparent that after queen f6, which was played in the game, at least he can now play queen d7. This pawn is no longer sitting in the way, so the queen is just in time defending the mating square here on g7. But now, rook to c5, restoring material uh, balance, and also immediately threatening again to eliminate the defender, the queen on d7, um, followed by uh, the win of the queen or mate on g7. But still, there is a defensive resource. Tal now plays rook c4, and of course that again defends against the white rook coming to uh, coming to c7. Well, since that is an active rook, Korsnoy decides to exchange that rook and now prepares to bring in his other rook. And um, I think it's important uh, to take stock here for a moment. Because the critical factor in the position is that the black king is constantly being threaded with a checkmate in one, be it on g7 or on f8. And that means that both the black queen and rook are tied down to the defense. So that already gives you an indication that white has a very serious advantage, in fact a winning position. But uh, in order to be able to win the position, he also has to bring in his last resources. And the first piece to bring in to position is of course the rook. So he starts here with rook d2. Um, bishop e6 is played, a blocking move. And now it is not possible for, uh, for Korsnoy to go to the c-file via c2, because of course that square is unavailable. So he plays rook d1, aimed at activating his rook along the c-file via c1. And again, if a white rook appears on c7, it's just curtains. But Tana plays queen a7, reminding white, again, of his own rather weak king. And this is Korsnoy's 40th move, and he decides to repeat rook d2, just for the moment, just simply protecting the second ring. And Tal, Tal also repeats queen d7, hoping that maybe he can somehow save the game by just repeating the position. But of course, uh, Korsnoy wants nothing of that. And here the game was adjourned. 
Now, Korchnoi comments that he thinks that he doesn't need to look at the position during uh, during the break. I don't know actually when the game was uh, resumed. Sometimes they did it after dinner, or sometimes they would have special days where they would finish a German games, or it just simply happened the next day. But he thought, hmm, this position is just easily winning, I don't really need to take a look at it. But a little bit later on he said that he was um, disappointed, and that it wasn't so easy to win it, and that he really had to go all out later on. Now, I'm not sure if he didn't look at the position, but he starts again with the Rook D1 move, and Tall thinks, okay, we're almost there, almost there to repeating the position, but now Korchnoi has a surprise. Since the Queen is forced to defend the mating square on G7, it means that White Rook can just about do anything, and instead of putting it back on d2, which defends the f2 square, he now puts it on d4, which also defends the f2 square, because the f2 square is simply not available, because the diagonal is blocked. And of course, the rook cannot be taken, because then queen takes g7 is checkmate, right? So, after rook d4, Tall saw nothing better than queen d7. Um, it should be noted also that with rook d4 and defending against the f2 check, Korchnoi is now threatening the d7 move. Because if he can play d7, then he would be attacking the defender of the f8 mating square. And of course this pawn could not be taken by the queen, because then that would lose the queen. But that pawn could also not be taken by the bishop, because then the queen would no longer be protecting the g7 square. So also a move like bishop d5 doesn't really help, because then, okay, you wouldn't play d7, but first you play e6, forcing the bishop back to this e6 square, opening up the d-file for the white rook again, and now d7, same story, just win the position made to follow very quickly on g7 or, or f8. So, hence after rook d4, the surprising rook move, Tall retreated the queen to d7 to just be able to block that dangerous past d pawn. But now Korshnoi plays a fantastic move. Um, really finding the weak spot in Black's camp and also the the overworked pieces, one of which is also the bishop. He now plays g4. Very nice. And the idea is that if black does not exchange on g4, then white will exchange on f5. And no matter how black recaptures, suppose that white takes like this and black would recapture like that, then that would mean that the g-files opened up. And all that uh, white would need to do is just simply reroute the rook to the g-file and that would be curtains for black's king. And if white were to take and black were to recapture with the bishop, then it means that the bishop is no longer protecting the c4 square, which means that the rook can switch over to c4 and to c7, delivering the final blow from the left-hand side. So just a beautiful uh, move, really. So that's if black does not exchange himself on g4. But if he does, f takes g4, then that opens up another pathway, another highway maybe, I could even say, into black's camp, namely the f-file. So Korshnai wouldn't recapture here on g4, no. He said he would immediately activate his extra attacking piece, the rook along the f-file, and how on earth are we going to defend against these horrible threats here? It can't be done. Okay, so g4. Well, Tal in the end opted here for a6, a5, hoping to stir up some trouble on the queen side. And now, 
Korchnoi admits very honestly that he could have won much quicker with the planned, I suppose, G takes F5. Because G takes F5, rook D1, preparing to check on the G file. And after bishop F5, rook C4, as we've seen before. And now, again, after this, sorry, queen A7, which prepares to check on F2, we would have a similar blocking move, rook C5, when after A4, E6 again is uh, decisive. Bishop takes e6 and now rook c7 has become possible because um, now white's queen is also protecting the f2 square. Very nice. But instead of playing g takes f5 immediately as he has planned, he thinks that he has to bring in even more pieces and he now goes for a king march with g3. Not the best move, but still a very interesting concept in itself. We've seen many king marches in, um, over the course of chess history. Uh, a very famous one is, of course, the, the short, Nigel Short king march in the Alekin, uh defense game against Jan Timon, where the king would end up on h6, also uh, aiding White's queen in delivering a checkmate on g7. Well, here we won't see that, but still the idea of, a, of, of, of the king bringing it in also as a, as a fighting piece is very interesting. So he played king g3. Now Tal played rook b8 and Nimzowicz would have liked this thought. He used to write in his book My System in German Das ganze voran or freely translated everybody to the front. Queen f7 was played now and Korchnoi being the super grandmaster he was at that time certainly realizes that chess is not a game of tug of war but of sumo wrestling so he adds even more weight to the position with king g5 just supporting the queen on f6 with his own king now um, Paul could have made a mistake here by exchanging queens basically again playing uh, the tug of war game allowing white's king to come to the f6 square and uh, attacking the final blockading piece on e6 and if that piece moves then of course e6 and d7 and e7 follow with great strength easily winning the position for him so here after h takes g4 he didn't play that uh, he played uh, instead a bishop d7 he could have tried rook e8 as well but then again there is this this funny d7 uh, deflection move um, hitting the rook on e8 simultaneously when after bishop takes d7 now white will exchange queens but only for the tactical reason that he can now just simply pick up that bishop and this is of course also a, a winning end game for Kochner. so back to the game h takes g4 and bishop d7 was played now Korchnoi points out that he can also make a mistake with exchanging queens. Where on the previous move black should not exchange queens, here also white should not exchange queens. Because again exchanging queens pulls black's king into a better position. It pulls it towards the center and allows it to immediately control the e6 blockading square and there is not even a win inside anymore. As a matter of fact, facing a majority of two against one here on the queen side, white might even be in a tiny spot of trouble there. But of course these guys are grandmasters, they know that they don't just exchange because it's possible to exchange. No, instead the theme is all about bringing in the final uh, attacking piece and now he does so with rook c4 and again the rook cannot be taken because queen g7 would be checkmate so Tal just goes for it okay he says I got two pawns there let's see if I can stir up some trouble and the final phase with rook c7 is all about calculation now now again if Tal would exchange on f6 there would follow king f6 and we can see that all white's pieces are now on 
next half of the board, right? So this is very, very good. But there is this A3 trick, right? But why is this simply quicker and more menacing with E6? Now, Bishop E6, King E6, A takes B2, D7, B1 Queen, leads to a win after Rook C8, right? That would run into a mate. And um, after e6 and not a takes b2, uh, excuse me, not bishop takes e6, a takes b2 immediately, then e takes d7 amounts to the same. Um, you can promote and do a queen here, but the rook check on c8 will be lethal because this king is just completely uh, blocked in. Boxed in. Back to the game, where after rook c8. Tall plate a3, and now a very nice blow. Rook takes d7, eliminating that light square defender. When again, queen takes f6 is nothing because now white would rook capture with the pawn, leading to a very funny mate after a takes b2, f7 check, king h8, king f6, b1 queen, bishop g7 mate, very funny mate. So Tall had to play queen takes d7 here. But here comes the pawn attacking uh, the queen, who in turn is the defender still of the g7 mating square. And Tal went here for uh, queen a7. Now the final move um, that and, and set of variations that Korchner gives here is that um, he thought Tal should have played queen b5 here, which is uh, slightly more testing because this checks. Now the king has to go back. There is another check here with g5. And now white's king cannot go back because then it would be harassed by uh, black's queen eternally. So it has to go forward. But then, then there's this check. <laughs> the king has to go here. But at least now black manages to exchange queens like this. But it doesn't help him in this case either. Queen takes g6, h takes g6, and now d7, a takes b2 e7 and we can sense that this is not going to end well for black but the final moves of this variation are still very important because there is b5 check king h4 b1 queens e8 queens h7 queen e7 and um, of course of course now would have had to calculate all this, you know, and in time trouble you never know what, what happens, so these variations are more difficult. King h6 forced, g5 check, rook takes g5 forced, queen takes g5 check, now after king g7, two very um, precise checks, queen e7 check, king h6, uh, of course the king cannot go to the back rank because then d8 queens is made, so King h6 and now queen e3, which defends the g1 square. And you may ask, what does that have to do with the price of rice in China? Well, after king g7 and d8 queens, we can see that there's only one counter check in the position for black, and that is queen h1. But after king g3, there are no more checks left, because this check here on g1 is covered by the queen on e3 and with the two queens white will win this position so that's what Tal should have tried right after e6 the queen b5 check move but instead he opted for queen a7 which also poses a problem of course to white because now there's the queen e3 check threatened but Korsna has uh, a very strong queen and he centralizes it and with queen e5, he still keeps an eye on the mating square, but also now defends on e3. And still, of course, uh, works very well together with his passed pawns. He doesn't get any better than this. The queen is very nicely centralized and fulfills both attacking and defensive purposes. There followed a takes b2, e7, which threatens e8, king f7, <laughs> now the king is uh, trying uh, to defend itself, 
and if Corson now checks, then the king will run away like this, and if, again it's checked, then the king will run away like this. So there is still this very important hiding square on d7, and the king has become an important blockader and defender against these connected passports. But after king f7, Corson didn't check on f6, he instead laid d7, and here Tall resigned. There is just no defense against the e8 queening and checkmating move because if he were to take that pawn on d7, then that d7 square is blocked by the queen, and now queen f6 would indeed be checkmate after king e8 and queen f8 checkmate. Well, that was just one of the many, many impressive games Korsnoy played, of course. I hope you've enjoyed this one at least, and Korsnoy surely enjoyed himself uh, when analyzing this game on his DVD. So, rest in peace, Viktor Valvich Korsnoy. Well, that brings us to the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention, and see you in the next video. Bye bye.